Welcome back, everyone. I'm Fiona Gordley. I'm editor-in-chief of the BMJ, and I'm delighted to um, open this next session, which is uh, the BMJ King's Fund debate, um, although it won't be in a standard debate format, um, on regulating for quality. Um, before we start, I just need to make one announcement about the final session today. Uh, sadly, Lord Darcy has been called away to vote with a three-line whip, so there's something obviously terribly important going on at the House of Lords today. Um, but we're very delighted he'll be replaced by his colleague Dominic King, who is clinical lecturer in surgery at Imperial College in London. So um, apologies from Lord Darcy, but welcome to Dominic King. We have another um, change of personnel in this session. Uh, sadly, Ian Cumming couldn't come because he's unwell, but delighted that Sir Bruce Keogh has stepped into the breach and will open for us with his thoughts now. Um, but before I um, in, allow, ask him to do that, just to welcome also Anna Dixon, David Bennett, and Ali Parsa, and they will um, introduce themselves after we've heard from Bruce. So over to you, Bruce. Thank you very much indeed. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for um, taking the trouble to come back after lunch. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep my remarks pretty superficial, and then I'm going to throw out a challenge uh, at the end. When Aradazi was doing his review um, a couple of years ago, one of the things that came out of it was the formation of a thing called the National Quality Board. And the National Quality Board um, consists of a bunch of people that you can basically divide into four quadrants. In one quadrant sit the chairs of the, of the major system leaders in our health service. So Monitor, the CQC, NICE, the MPSA. In another corner, you have some usual suspects from the Department of Health, Chief Executive, Chief <coughs> Nursing Officer, Chief Medical Officer, Medical Director. And then in the other two quadrants, you have people who have an interest in healthcare quality, but who are either um, come from a healthcare background or don't. And the remarkable thing about that particular board is that although it doesn't have any statutory authority, it's the first time ever that the real leaders in our healthcare system have been brought together in a systematic way in one room, which gives that board a sense of pooled sovereignty where people are held to account by their, by their colleagues in the system. And when mid-staffs began to blow up, the Secretary of State asked the National Quality Board to review the early warning systems that we have in the National Health Service for identifying organizational failure before it happens. <coughs> and about a year later, a document was produced entitled uh, Early Warning Systems in the NHS. And then in July 2010, the Secretary of State um, announced uh, his reforms. And David Nicholson asked the National Quality Board to then embark on a new set of, uh, of tasks and to do a review in two phases. One was to look at how we preserved quality during the transition from the existing state that the NHS was in into the future state. Because it was inevitable that at some point we would go through a very, very dangerous period. A period where the existing system was beginning to crumble, but a period before the new system and organizations were up and running. And we know from mergers and acquisitions in, uh, in industry that that's a time of, of great uh, fragility in terms of quality. And we know in the clinical arena that the time of great fragility and greatest risk to our patients is at the time of handover, either from one clinical team to another or from one organization or specialty to another. So we produced in March this year a document about safety in the transition. And there is a second document about to be produced which tries to define the roles and responsibilities with a great degree of clarity for the new players in, uh, in the NHS. Now, <clears throat> you might ask, well, why is that important? Because we all know how we fit together. We might think we know how we fit together, but this new system 
is very, very different. Just to give you one perspective is that currently 161 statutory organizations will be shut down and will be replaced by one. So that's all the PCTs, the SHAs, will be replaced, for example, by the commissioning board. And the commissioning board will be a single national organization. So there are some very, very big changes afoot. And I think that provides us with some unique opportunities, probably some greater opportunities, uh, the greatest opportunities that we've seen since the inception of the NHS in 1948. But it also poses some risks. We have to get the interrelationships between the new organizations, including the regulators, including those that set standards, into the right place, or we will be no better than we were before, and we will be in the same sort of position that allowed um, incidents such as Mid-Staffordshire and others, others to occur. So we have this new legislative framework, and it is just that, actually. It's a high-level framework. <coughs> we, and by that I mean those of us who work in the service, need to sit down and need to define how the different parts of the new architecture relate to each other. And that gets down to a set of behaviors and, inter and, uh, and interorganizational relationships which we have the ability to, uh, to define. So I think we're at just the start of the process at the moment. We need a better understanding of the new system and its architecture. We need a better understanding of the different roles and responsibilities that different um, players in the system will have, including the regulators. And we need a better understanding of the issues uh, that need to be managed to ensure success in the new system. But most importantly, I think as those of us who, who act as caretakers for this transition need to ensure that quality is preserved during what's going to be a very, a very difficult time. So as the National Quality Board start to, to think about this, We've posed ourselves a set of questions. Now, I would like you to imagine that organizations and individuals who are providing clinical services fit on a distribution curve. I've drawn it as a normal distribution curve here. In real life, it isn't. But for illustrative purposes, um, it's like that today. And the first question we need to ask is, who sets the quality bar? Who, des who decides at what point quality achieves or fails uh, an acceptable level. The second question is, once that bar is set, who is responsible for maintaining it? The third question is, who is responsible in our system for driving continuous quality improvement so that we shift the whole of the curve to the right? The fourth question is, how do we spot and tackle very early failure that some people call pre-failure? The fifth question is, how do, we, how do we respond to a specific service failure? And that might be simply a, a service line failure within an organization that's functioning quite well. It may be multiple service lines. And finally, how do we respond to serious systemic failure? Now, one of the things that has bothered me over the last three or four years has been that every time there's a problem in our health service, the politicians, the media, and others immediately turn around and they say, where was the regulator? We've got the balance wrong. Because it's not the regulator that treats patients. It's not the regulator that's rude to people. It's not the regulator that screws up the, the transfer of information between organizations. Whenever we see failure in the system, in my view, it's a failure of professionalism and generally clinical leadership. And the reason I say that is that, you, can, that you, you don't find a good clinical service without good clinical leadership. You may find quite a good one with absent clinical leadership, but you'll never find a good one without good clinical leadership. And you won't find a bad service that has good clinical leadership. It's generally got absent or poor clinical leadership. And if we look at provider organizations, they are simply aggregates of different service lines, and our NHS 
is an aggregate of different organizations, providers, and commissioners um, uh, within the system. So actually, if you go back to the root cause, the fundamental issue lies generally with professionalism at a number of different levels and often a lack of humanity. So I put it to you that it's time for a real debate on where we put the emphasis on regulation and where the pecking order for regulators lies and whether we've got that balance right at the moment. So against that background, the next uh, meeting of the National Quality Board is on the 15th of December. We've had a, a workshop with key players to try and work out some of these issues. My challenge to the King's Fund, um, and I guess I'm looking at Anna, would be to produce a report on the deliberations today and other deliberations which you may have had that we can feed into that meeting. That way you know that some of your thoughts and your comments today will actually be fed right into the heart of the, of the thought processes that will define the regulatory system for the foreseeable future in the National Health Service. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, can I just ask, you were responsible, I think, for responding to what might be considered a systemic failure in uh, cardiac surgery um, m many years ago. Do you think that competition um, or regulation or both or neither played a part in the response that you achieved amongst the cardiothoracic <coughs> surgeons? I think that was a, a fairly unique set of circumstances, Fear, and I think, I think there was fear. There was fear when, that, uh, when Ian Kennedy was conducting his review that somehow or other the specialty would be, would be cast in a very bad light and people wanted to rectify that through a sense of professional pride really. Um, and I think that's what, that's what drove it. The, the issue that we need to face now is how we, how we do that without a sense of fear but with a sense of of uh, professional engagement and endeavor within the health service. Thank you very much. Well, let me turn first then to Dr. Anna Dixon, who is Director of Policy at the King's Fund. Bruce has given you a challenge, Anna, but could you, in addition to answering his challenge, address the general broad question of whether competition improves quality? Um, thank you, Fiona, and uh, thank you, Bruce, for uh, um, meaning that I'm going to have a pretty busy couple of weeks before Christmas, but uh, uh, very um, uh, happy to take up um, the invitation to share some of our thoughts um, at the King's Fund and certainly those of, of others that we hear today uh, about how we can ensure uh, a, a system of quality uh, assurance and quality regulation uh, in the future. <clears throat> I think it's clear to all of us that when we talk about competition and its impact on quality, that we are talking about regulated competition. And so I think it's always a question of what is the balance between the role of regulation and uh, the role of other drivers uh, in the system that can uh, um, drive uh, quality. And there's been a lot of uh, discussion uh, and debate about the role of competition uh, in, in driving quality. And certainly underpinning some of the uh, reforms and the government's uh, proposals is a view that competition uh, can drive up quality. And they point to uh, a couple of uh, econometric studies that have been done um, uh, and use these to uh, suggest that competition can improve quality. I'm a little bit more skeptical myself. These studies, uh, whilst methodologically excellent, um, are somewhat limited in that they are looking only at uh, competition for the uh, elective surgery uh, market. Their measures of quality are limited. Uh, their measures of competition are very specifically uh, measures that um, are widely used in economic studies, but I don't think they necessarily get to the heart of um, what it, uh, the incentives and responses of providers. They do show that in areas uh, that have experienced less uh, competition, uh, that there have been slower improvements in the uh, uh, quality marker that they uh, that they use, um, but. We have done a review both of uh, the whole of the market reforms, looking at the combination of choice, information, payment by results, uh, commissioning and underpinned by regulation, and, and have reviewed the evidence across all the dimensions of the market reforms. 
And um, whilst there have been some impacts, they're pretty modest. Um, they haven't uh, fulfilled, I think, some of the worst fears of the critics uh, of, of the market in healthcare, um, where we have seen an impact. It's in the direction that one might expect. Um, but I think from our qualitative work and, the, and some of the other qualitative studies that we reviewed, um, the fact is that when you talk to providers, it is not the choices that patients are making, it is not competition that is driving a focus on service improvement and improvements in quality. Um, the things that have been driving those service improvements vary um, from targets and performance management. That has been a feature of, of the system to date, that, that top-down performance management has been uh, uh, something that has, um, where the boards have focused, where senior executives have focused. And I think we were hearing earlier today that that needs to change, and hopefully one of the messages coming out of the Francis inquiry will be uh, the need for greater board leadership of quality and safety and we were hearing about some of the ways in which non-execs need to change and the information available to them needs to change uh, to support that. But a lot of what they're focusing on is the experience of the patients uh, that they're treating and um, the evidence uh, that uh, exists suggests that the ability to exit, the ability of patients to go elsewhere, they will exercise that if they've had a poor experience themselves at a, at a hospital, at a local hospital, or indeed that their friends and family have had a poor experience, which does suggest that there is a real imperative for organisations to focus on continuous quality improvement for, based on feedback of patients uh, that they're treating. <clears throat> I think the other type of competition that we perhaps um, uh, don't pay enough attention to is peer competition. We've heard things today about benchmarking. Um, and there is a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, peer competition or yardstick competition uh, uh, is quite powerful. When you present, uh, whether it's on an individual level or an organizational level, when you present data about how people are doing compared to others, that is a very strong motivator for improvement and one that I think we haven't uh, always fully um, harnessed. And the providers that we spoke to were also clear that uh, the, the behaviour of commissioners was really important and that where there was co genuine competition for the market, um, that that was starting to make providers look differently at their services, think about how they could change, perhaps how they could partner with others to innovate and uh, improve care. So I think um, whilst the studies point to um, some, uh, in some narrow studies of competition in, in, in particular areas of care to some um, added uh, value around quality, I think the, the, looking at the overall evidence base, we would be foolish to think that that sort of competition between organisations for patients is really going to be a spur for quality improvement. I think we do have to look to using uh, purchasing power around uh, commissioning and decommissioning. We have to use information uh, and benchmarking, and those are the things that are probably going to be more powerful uh, in driving quality improvement uh, than competition. Thanks, Anna. And you've done a great deal of work on patient choice. Do you feel that um, patients in the NHS are sufficiently empowered and um, uh, that they want to act um, on choice and are able to do it at the moment? Well, I think it's clear that patients derive some uh, sort of intrinsic value from being able to uh, have a choice. We do know that some of the choices patients are most interested in are, are having... Uh, being involved in decisions about their care and treatment um, and less so about where they're treated. I think some of that is because uh, patients may not fully understand uh, the differences in quality. Patients do want uh, and, and expect uh, regulators like the Care Quality Commission, in a sense, to be making sure that wherever uh, people go, uh, there is a minimum standard of quality and safety. And I think that's why uh, the regulator is, is, is so vital. Um, and people genuinely find the information available pretty overwhelming. Again, the research that we have looked at at things like NHS choices, apart from people with very high numeracy levels, this is extremely complex information to process. And people at the end of the day do use their own experience as the main uh, 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 reason why they choose uh, either to attend the local hospital or to, to exercise their right to go elsewhere. 
Thank you very much indeed, Anna. Um, now turning to David Bennett, who um, was the non-political chief policy advisor to, to Tony Blair and head of policy directorate and the strategy unit at 10 Downing Street, um, and more recently has been providing strategic and operational support to the public sector and working in particular with monitors board. So I wondered, David, if I could ask you, obviously the broad question of does competition improve quality, but specifically the role of the regulator and how you see that functioning in the new uh, structure. Yes, uh, the, um, <clears throat> I think one of the starting points is uh, to remember, uh, I think it was Aradazi's definition of quality, the three dimensions, safety, effectiveness, and experience. And I think all three uh, are relevant here. Also, um, as Anna has already indicated, competition is, after all, only one of the tools um, that are available to imp uh, improve quality and uh, monitoring its new role as a sector regulator. Um, we'll have other important tools available, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on. In terms of competition itself, um, uh, again, as Anna says, competition within markets, uh, particularly under the uh, now any qualified provider scheme, um, uh, does appear um, to drive uh, improvement in quality, but the evidence is, is very limited. And I think one of the very important things that uh, uh, for a regulator to do um, uh, as we move into this new regime is, uh, first of all, to make sure uh, there's a, uh, as much evidence as possible is available. So one of the things uh, we will be able to do under um, particular circumstances is actually to require people to make information available on the basis of which analysis can be done uh, and published uh, so that over time we'll get a much stronger evidence base for making decisions about when and how, for example, competition is an effective way um, of improving quality. Um, and of course we also have competition for markets as well as within markets. Um, in fact, I think I heard David Nicholson quote the other day that I think last year something like eight billion pounds worth of NHS uh, services were, were tendered uh, in a competitive process. Um, the job of the regulator in many ways um, is to support commissioners as they go about the commissioning of services to make sure um, uh, it's done in, in an effective and fair way. Obviously, a critical problem in all of this is that it's very difficult to measure quality, and certainly today uh, we, um, we find it difficult to get timely and reliable quality information. So that's an area, too, where I think uh, we will need to push. And certainly until um, we've got that, we need to be very cautious about how we use competition to drive um, improvements. Uh, although it, there is some evidence from other sectors that, in fact, um, the use, the definition of, in this case, quality as the metric against which um, different <coughs> providers will compete can uh, actually drive them to make more uh, information, more quality information available. Um, so I think uh, much of what uh, we're going to be doing is about facilitating the process, but fundamentally it's going to be driven by commissioners. Okay. Um, can I ask then, uh, before we hand over to Ali Passa, about what happens when systems fail and, and whether in a system like the NHS where there's a reluctance to allow hospitals to fail, and as we heard in the previous session, potentially a reluctance to... Um, let go clinicians who don't perform to the level they should do at any, whether it be the surgical checklist or um, just not being up to the job and, and reluctance to people to address that problem. How, how can we if, we, if we're not prepared to have that level of, agree, accept that level of failure, how can we um, see competition really working in the NHS? I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily link the issue of failure to the issue of competition. Um, I think the issue of failure is an extraordinarily important one. Um, if, if we're not prepared to face up to those situations uh, where uh, organisations are failing to provide safe and high-quality care, um, then uh, we're going to perpetuate problems. Now, one of the things here, of course, is the role of CQC, uh, with whom we already work very closely in our current role as uh, regulators of the foundation trusts. And um, I think, therefore, uh, in the future, it's essential that CQC continues to define and measure against those uh, minimum or essential standards. Uh, if that, in turn, leads to financial difficulties, and I think this is where things have gone muddied in the past, 
if that leads to financial difficulties, what we need is a mechanism for dealing with those rather than hiding them, which I think sometimes has happened. And so one of the features of the new regime is that there will be more systematic ways of recognizing that when an organization is failing, which is then leading to financial difficulties, they get fixed rather than hidden. Thank you very much indeed, David. Uh, now, handing over to Ali Parsa, who's a social entrepreneur who founded Circle, um, which is a very unusual player in the uh, new structures within the NHS, delivering both public and private sector health care, uh, and in some aspects of what Circle does, um, a, a, an employee staff ownership model, uh, which I think is considered a, a rather interesting initiative. Um, Ali began in physics, but has now moved into healthcare. So over to you, Ali. Does competition improve quality, and um, what is the role of the regulator in this? Um, <clears throat> Fiona, in one period in my life, I became evil, and I became an investment banker. And as an investment banker, one thing I saw, I dealt with a lot of industries across the board, from car parking to airlines to telecom to technology. And every one of those industries had one single thing in common. And they all thought they are absolutely unique. There is no other industry on the planet like them. Their drivers, what makes them work, tick, governs, is unique. I say that because I want to use an example. And I'm sure healthcare is very unique, and it has nothing to do with this example. <laughs> <laughs> but I let your imagination loose. So for decades, decades, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, all early 80s, one single company, IBM, was responsible for 90% of profitability globally in technology. There was an expression that became globally known as nobody will ever get sacked buying IBM. Nobody thought anybody but IBM can innovate. That was it until one single thing happened. In 1975, a group of kids invented the PC. And the barrier to entry went from millions of dollars into thousands of dollars. And then see what happened. Those kids in Microsoft and Apple did what IBM could never do. Yahoo did what Microsoft could never do. Google did what Yahoo could never do. And remember, people at Yahoo would say, I wouldn't buy Google for a million dollars. It's rubbish. It's never going to work. Right? Imagine if people at Yahoo had to ask for permission for, from Microsoft or Google from Yahoo to play. <coughs> Where would we be today? Right? So when we say that I do not agree competition works, remember what we are saying. We are saying I do not allow others to innovate. You're saying if you're not from that industry, if you don't already own a hospital, if you're not a manager of a GP practice, you're not allowed to solve a major social problem in this country. We're keeping them out. <laughs> what competition is, is about bringing barrier to entry down to allowing others to play. And what is our fear? If others can't do the good job, they just disappear. And the patient choice that David and his team and the Tony Blair Institute Patients now have the choice to go with the advice of their GPs where they go. And if people do a bad job, they just wouldn't go there. If I came to you three years ago, before Tony Blair allowed choice, and I said, I'm going to create a hospital that I'm going to get Norman Foster, one of the best architects in here, build a building that will win the award for the best public space globally. They're going to get Mandarin Oriental guys to do the service. They're going to get a Michelin star chef to cook every single day for your patients. And we're going to deliver all of that to NHS patients at NHS prices. You would have thought I was mad. Well, you're right about that. I am mad. <laughs> <laughs> and if I would have thought that out of my last 2,000 patients, two have gone back to operating theaters, you would have thought it's impossible. Right? But that's what competition does. And guess who did that? I didn't do that from outside. All I did was allow the people in the sector to break away from the structures that they were shackled to, to innovate. It was our doctors, our nurses, our healthcare managers, people who worked in the NHS who did that. Who do you think created Microsoft? People from IBM. Who created Yahoo? People from Microsoft. 
So don't get yourself shackled into the structures to defend those structures. Free yourself to do what you know you can do. And I have a problem with studies on competition. <laughs> and my problem is this. So if I ask you today to go and do a study, maybe I can also, Bruce, if you allow me, to give King's Fund a challenge. <laughs> no competition, Ali. <laughs> yes, please, please go to one of our competitors with that. <laughs> so, so can we do a study to see whether women driving in Saudi Arabia will improve the quality of driving in Saudi Arabia? Because I'm told, and I, I actually was in a com, uh, conversation with some a Saudi Arabian, before Saudi was a prince, I should have been much more honorable talking to him out of the that, that actually women can't drive. It's not up to them. Men are better. Proved. They've done studies on that, right? They've seen it. They checked it. They know it, right? And look at that compare it with the rest of the world. How do you know? when we don't have competition in this country. And please don't tell me, just because we're a little bit of doodling around on elective surgery, we do competition. Because I tell you what a competition we do. We are not, nowhere near, there's nobody in here who believes that we are even 50% down a competitive market, right? Right, but let me tell you, even if we were 80% down the competitive market, just remember this, a human being shares 83% of its DNA with a cockroach. Right. It's the other 17% that makes a difference. What we got is the cockroach. Let's have the human being then do the studies. Thank you. <laughs> I gather the cockroaches will outlast us, so that may not be a very good analogy. Um, Ali, can I just ask, you talk about fear, and I would accept that there is, um, you know, I feel it as editor of the BMJ, a lot of fear reflected back at at the journal um, in relation to what will happen if competition, red in tooth and claw, um, afflicts uh, the NHS, as some people see it in that way. Uh, and one of the issues that people talk about is those areas where competition will not necessarily deliver um, or, or cannot deliver um, improvements. And the, the issues are rural areas, that's one of the things that's mentioned, and types of care that are, tend to be neglected, mental health and th those sort of areas. What would you say to those, to those concerns? I say, look in history, right? So I remember exactly the same fear. I was just talking to Tim Smart, who used to come from British Telecom, who runs King's College and does a great job at it. And he reminded me of his time at BT. And I remember that the, when we, the privatization of BT came, the big fear, for those of most of you are not old enough, none of you are ugly enough to remember it, I, I'm both. And I remember the big thing was, what happens to our rural areas? They're going to disappear. There's not going to be any telecommunication in our rural areas, right? They're all going to think. And look at what happened, right? What we didn't do and what we should never do, we never shut down British Telecom to open competition up to others. We didn't give the business of British Telecom to anybody else. All we did, we brought the barrier down and said to Vodafone, go break a leg. Do whatever you want to do and let people choose. And the, the other day, I moved house, Fiona. And... Uh, uh, British Telecom is as great as it always is. It didn't connect my phone for weeks. <laughs> right? But did I care? I had my mobile phone. I had my neighbor's Wi-Fi to pirate into. <laughs> Everything worked. I have no problem. People have fears, and that's the job of the regulator, to make sure nobody comes down that breaks the standards, the quality, what needs to be delivered. I also think that a competition that happened in the ISTC thing that took somebody's business and gave it to a public monopoly, to a private monopoly, that's rubbish too. But just bring the barrier down. Let people set up other things. And if it's good, people go to them. If it's not good, nobody will go to them. Nobody has anything to fear in that respect. Thank you very much, Ali. I'm going to open this up now to uh, the audience, and then at the end we'll ask each of the panel members to come back with a, a brief uh, final comment. So we've got microphones. Um, I'm alerted to people at the back who may want to contribute as well, who have found it difficult to join in. So please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. There's one here. Um, there's a cluster over there. So if we have one here and three over there, and then we'll ask the panel to respond. Could you say who you are, please? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to all the panel. Um, I'm David Walborn. I'm from Cass Business School. Um, question for um, uh, Bruce, really, um, that um, 
you mentioned the, the, the need to improve professionalism, and that came through the sessions that we had this morning as well. Uh, and, and yet the discussion about the regulator is focused on system regulation more than it is focused on professional regulation. And, and would you like to, uh, uh, to, to add some comment about how you, you see professional and system regulation working together? Thank you very much. If we could have the question there. Hello, I'm uh, Kiran Palmer. I am from BT. Uh, <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> a brave man. If we don't have somebody from Saudi Arabia here, I would have learned to bring it through. Perhaps we do. Uh, but I'm also deputy chairman of the Northwest London Hospital Trust. Um, we were talking about fear, and I guess one of the fears is that uh, competition will um, strand a certain number of the assets that we've got in the acute sector today, for example and it'll be the public purse that ends up picking up uh, that cost. And I'd like to have your comments on that, please. Thank you very much. Could you pass the microphone to, oh, there's one behind you, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Jenny Dean from the Cambridge Judge Business School. Um, and I've got a question mainly for Sir Bruce, but perhaps Ali has some ideas on this. Um, I was interested in your quality curve and, um, and the fact that it focuses very much on the avoidance of failure and wondering um, how can we shift the incentives so that the focus is increasingly on striving towards excellence rather than just avoidance of failure. Thank you very much. And the gentleman there. Uh, yes, uh, my name is John Fagg, uh, uh, Norwich Clinical Commissioning Group. Uh, it was really a question uh, relating to the role of the, of the commissioner. Perhaps a, a final question on your, on your slide. What will the new regulatory architecture mean for commissioners? What we've seen uh, in the Mid-Staffs inquiry and, and others is, quite rightly, the Commission is regarded as bearing a full share of accountability for system failures. Um, what should the role be of clinical commission groups going forward, and how do we assure quality where we're one step away from the provision of care? Very good. Thank you very much. And with luck, we'll have a, a time for another round of questions. So, Bruce, um, over to you about professionalism versus regulatory um, improvement. <coughs> I think that's a, that's a really good question because that, in a sense, is part of the challenge that I've thrown out to, to shift from blaming the system to actually accepting that a system is, a, uh, is an aggregate of individuals. I think the, the way this is moving, and I'll speak particularly from the point of view of the medical profession, is the concept of revalidation, um, where doctors have to be revalidated by the General Medical Council every five years. That in itself is simply the tip of a bigger iceberg, and, and the main body of the iceberg is the use of appraisal in organizations. We have evidence that there's still quite a lot of people who aren't appraised, but appraisal provides the one opportunity when uh, an organization sits down with an individual to discuss with them the quality of care that they both provide. And I think it's an underused tool. So I think there's something about how we get that discussion to be reflected in a regulatory process, which is what revalidation will be. And then in terms of linking the, the um, regulators together on this, I was concerned about this really before the Mid-Staffs Inquiry and asked the, the CQC to take on the role of holding the ring of the professional regulators so that there's a link between the, the regulators of the different professions and the CQC. Um, and that should not just be about standards, but that should also be about information transfer. So we, we're getting there. Thanks, Bruce. Um, David, I don't know if you want to address the avoidance of failure, how to move from avoidance of failure to, to um, excellence, um, or any of the other aspects Already. of the question. <laughs> Uh, let me pick up on two. Uh, on that issue of um, how you, I mean, I think it's, um, it's Bruce's chart, really, isn't it? How do you get from that yeah. point of um, avoiding failure to continuous improvement, uh, which in many ways I think is, at the moment, uh, an issue for us as the FT regulator. Um, uh, and frankly, I think it is, it is an unanswered question um, uh, uh, right now. We're, I think we're pretty clear about the role of CQC in defining that essential standard, which must be met. Um, I think we have to work out how to drive standards up beyond that. But I'm sure the heart of the answer must lie um, to a very significant extent in, in the role that commissioners need to play. Um, uh, now, I'm sure in conjunction with CQC and uh, NICE and others, but I think the commissioners are really at the heart of, of that. 
Let me just pick up on one other issue as well, which was raised, which is, which is this issue of stranded costs, uh, which someone asked about. And I think um, this is an issue, um, I, I, and there is quite a lot of complexity around it. I, I, I just make one very simple point, which is you mustn't let this issue get in the way of allowing change to happen. And what, whatever the mechanism for change is, whether it's the behavior of commissioners, the use of competition, or any other mechanism, there will be costs to change, but if you don't incur the costs, you won't get the change, and that's essential. Thank you very much, David. Anna, um, how do we make commissioners accountable for quality? If well, I've got the question right. Yeah, um, I mean, I think the role of commissioners is, is really vital, particularly um, the uh, bit of Bruce's curve to the right, because I think um, where regulators, whether that be professional regulator or CQC, um, obviously have a clear role in entry um, and making sure that those minimum standards of quality and safety are uh, met. Um, and there is a real need for others in the system to be driving uh, uh, aspiration uh, uh, towards uh, excellence. And I think that um, commissioners have a key role in that, both in terms of the way they contract, uh, what they set as the outcomes, um, and measures uh, for uh, determining the performance of providers against those, and um, indeed how they pay for care. And I think that um, both the commissioning board as well as local CCGs have a, a critical role in this, uh, in the commissioning guidance that the commissioning board uh, will um, introduce in the uh, the way that the currencies themselves are, are defined, what is it we're paying for. So I think um, that uh, in future, if, if uh, um, commissioners are more focused on outcomes uh, and also on some of those aspirational uh, outcomes, that they would be uh, finding ways to uh, reward providers for moving towards excellence. But um, I think I just wanted to respond um, also, if I may, to, um, to, to Ali and to sort of say, uh, please do not interpret what my understanding of this study is as being uh, uh, evidence that, uh, that we shouldn't have competition. But I think rather I was pointing to the fact that we need the right type of competition and that the studies and the, and the, the type of competition that we've used so far in the NHS is pretty limited. The unit of competition is the hospital. I don't think is necessarily the right unit of competition. I don't necessarily think that the any qualified provider uh, is necessarily the right type of competition. And I think that uh, we seem to have either have any qualified provider or some exclusive contract for five or ten years. And we, we, we're forgetting that there's actually something in the between where purchasers can use their commissioning power to at least um, uh, uh, have a sort of a selection, a menu, as it were, of, of pre-selected um, high-performing providers uh, amongst whom patients could potentially have a choice. And I think we need the right sort of quality competition as well. And there's a real danger that it's the easily observable things that patients base their choices on. Um, uh, we see in other countries a sort of arms race. It's the bigger technology. It's the hotel facilities. Um, it's the nice food and the, and, and the nice ho hotel facilities, which I know are important. But um, the difficult things to observe around clinical quality are actually the, uh, the more important uh, 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 things to, to make sure we get right. And I don't think we can necessarily rely on quality competition for those where those things are, are pretty difficult to observe. So I think it was really just to say we do need the right type of competition and we certainly must have innovation. And um, uh, I think regulation needs to remove some of the barriers to entry and some of the barriers to innovation that we have at the moment. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Anna. Ali, do you want to respond to that and also um, just to tell us how you get on with your commissioners? Uh, we get on fine with our commissioners. Um, the, but we have seen behaviors. I mean, as you know, we took some of our commissioners to, uh, to the panel uh, on the fact that they came in and uh, somehow under pressure they decided that we could only do four million pounds of, uh, of work in four sectors. And that was their definition of competition. In four specialities, in four, we thought that wasn't right. We took it to the panel. The panel, in our view, absolutely made the right judgment. The Secretary of State reinforced it last week, and we think that is right. Uh, I, I want to actually, and I think Anna is right, that there is a whole variety of competition, so I think that's, that's correct too. On the commissions, there's one danger that we're going to face now, and we have to be very careful about it. And I don't know whether that's maybe it's a question for David that is in his realm or not. I think we're doing something really dangerous with these reforms. 
And I don't know whether we are focused on this or not. We are asking GPs to become commissioners, which is the right thing to do. I think asking those who are closest to the patients to advise them on that is right. But at the same time, we have not clarified for the GPs that where they should, what is their role? Is their role to advise the patient what to choose, or is their role to decide that, well, actually, this bit of it I can provide myself, I'm going to do it myself. And in and the day that we hear a GP making 700,000 pounds in Kent and 400,000 pounds in London, and I was just now talking to, to, to a GP friend of mine who sits in a commissioning board, and here's a story she told me, which I thought was fascinating. One GP brought to their commissioning board a uh, motion to be able to do a whole set of things themselves. And then people said, well, that's a good idea. And then he turned back and said, well, actually, I have a company that, by the way, I just established that can do all of this. They said, well, then we have to give it to you. And they did. And I mean, luckily, the PCTs are not gone yet. They, they can't simply just do it. But there is a significant danger there. And we have to be very careful that we don't, I mean, the Daily Telegraph, you saw it yesterday, almost half a page, or have the GPs replace the bankers, I think. <laughs> But, 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 but there, is, there, is a, there is something we have to be careful about. And, I, and I'm saying we have to be careful about it, but I'm pretty not hopeful that we are. And I think that people like David, I'm hopeful that they can be focused on this. Because I think the danger in here is that competition will be killed before it gets. And I just inherited a hospital in Hinchinbrook where the dermatology unit is completely shut down now, has been for a while. Why? Because the easiest stuff, the cherries, were picked up by the community. Right? And then the hospital couldn't maintain its things. Speaking of cherries, by the way, if any of you in any of your areas where you do healthcare have cherries, please keep them. But if you do have any potatoes, I would love to help you with those. <laughs> so anything that is difficult, please come and see us. We would love to work with you on it. That, that's hot potatoes, I, I think. It's <laughs> hot, um, cold, medium. Hot or cold potatoes. Um, I'm going to then, in the interest of time, David, would you like to just answer that question? It seems to me we're saying who's going to, be over, who's going to oversee the commissioners? How are we going to avoid that conflict of interest that Ali mentioned if competition is going to thrive? Yes, and of course the issue here is that the commissioners, uh, the GPs as commissioners, are suppliers, providers as well. So this whole issue of self-supply comes up. Um, it's not yet entirely clear how all of this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are important decisions still to be made, and we obviously have to, um, uh, ourselves, once those decisions are made, because they are they're decisions for the government, uh, we then have to work out um, what we're going to do. But it, it, it is clearly um, a, a very complex area. Um, uh, our starting point will be very simple, though. Um, whatever um, a GP is doing, whether as a commissioner or as a provider, they need to be able to demonstrate it's in the best interests of uh, patients. That's the fundamental point. Thank you very much. On that note, I must thank our panelists. Sorry we didn't have another time for another round of questions. Um, I think if we read, um, instead of competition, innovation, maybe that's a better word. Uh, we want to encourage innovation. Um, thank you very much for your contributions. Enjoy your breakout sessions, and have a great afternoon.